year when everyone was concerned about the economy going into a recession during a banking crisis, and now no longer. Um, so let's start with why that is, that people are no longer concerned about a recession. Yeah, I think it's a combination of those things. First of all, there's no signs of recession. Um, I never thought there were signs of recession, but there's certainly no signs of recession in the, in the economic numbers. And also at this point, you know, uh, people were going nuts sort of early last year with this recession thing. We're, we're over a year since then. The stock market has gone essentially straight up, not straight up, but up a lot since then. And I think it's a question of you're embarrassing yourself at this point if you still are calling for a recession. Is it time to take profits? Our next guest, Jason Shapiro, founder of CrowdedMarketReport.com, has correctly called the market rally of 2023 going against the bearish sentiment of the economy. Now that a recession is less of a hot topic in the news, Jason is warning that sentiment may be heading towards euphoria, which is a sign to take the other side of the crowded bullish trade. Now, Jason has been featured in Jack Schweiger's book, Unknown Market Wizards, and has had decades of trading experience. So if you're a trader or wants to learn about a very unique trading philosophy, don't miss this episode. First, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Moomoo, which is a very unique trading platform. Now, what I like about Moomoo is that it's not just for trading. There's a suite of educational tools you can use as well to make yourself a better trader or investor. For example, if you're interested in learning about options, uh, simply open Moomoo, click on options, and there you'll find the relevant courses. Moomoo provides a whole suite of study plans. It's step-by-step, -step, simple, and user-friendly. Uh, user interface is very well received by its users. There's also a paper trading simulation that allows you to replicate the feel of real trading. So click on the link down below to learn more about Moomoo's features, as well as their cash sweep program that offers a yield on your deposit of cash. Welcome back, Jason. Thanks for having me, David. Thanks for being here. Last year, you were telling us about how uh, it was time to stay long because the markets were rallying and people were bearish in the economy and it was you know, prudent to uh, take the opposite side of that sentiment. You would come back on the show, you told me, once people stopped talking about a recession and it was time to exit that part of the trade, meaning not be bearish along with the bearish people in the economy. Are we there yet in the sense that have people stopped talking about a recession? I personally believe that we we have gotten there now yes there's no more talk about recession um really you know if you talk about recession you're you're kind of left out of the room at this point so i think that for for that part of uh of the psychology we are no longer in everybody calling for recession mode for sure um i can just attest to that personal anecdote because i uh i interview a lot of people and um fewer people on my show have been talking about the prospects of a recession, or at least it's just not as hot as a topic anymore. Um, obviously, there are still some people who remain that um, the economy will falter into recession at some point, but it's no longer a major theme of discussion. Just going on Google Trends, you can see that in the US, the term recession has waned in interest over the last 12 months steadily. Um, it peaked around last year, exactly this time last year, when everyone was concerned about the economy going into recession during a banking crisis, and now no longer. Um, so let's start with why that is, that people are no longer concerned about a recession. We're not no longer, but less concerned. Is it because that you can, is it because economic indicators are really just very good or is it because we've already had one technically in some way, or is it because, um, you know, people, people have just moved on to other topics? What's your take? Yeah, I think it's a combination of those things. First of all, there's no signs of recession. Um, I never thought there were signs of recession, but there's certainly no signs of recession in the, in the economic numbers. And also at this point, you know, uh, people were going nuts sort of early last year with this recession thing. We're, we're over a year since then. The stock market has gone essentially straight up, not straight up, but up a lot since then. And I think it's a question of you're embarrassing yourself at this point if you still are calling for a recession. So you can't do it anymore, you know, to say that, that some people are saying there's going to be a recession eventually. I mean... I think we can be pretty sure that there's going to be a recession eventually. Well, what does that tell us? That doesn't tell us anything. There's always a recession at some point for some period of time, right? Um, but you can't really be uh, out there as a strategist or as a market pundit or whatever right now and still be calling for a recession because people are just going to hang up on you at this point, you know? No, no one, so you can't do it. I mean, peer pressure alone just, just stops you from doing it.
Well, uh, Jason, like you told me last year, we can't trade the CPI numbers. We can't trade the GDP numbers. We can trade the market. So that's, let's, that's what we're here to do. Talk about the markets and what we can do to trade those markets. Stocks have gone up in a straight line last year, like you said. Is it time to take profits? Open-ended question. I'll let you answer that however you want. So, I mean, it, it depends on what kind of investor you are and what kind of trader you are. Um, I think that I, I personally like to call what I, I try to get low-hanging fruit. Um, I don't think that being long here is long, low hanging fruit anymore since we have switched out of the recession thing. Um, it, it, it strikes me that we are now in a belief system with people that the market can't go down because, you know, it, it, even if we have recession, the Fed's got our back and they're going to cut rates and that'll be fine anyway. So clearly the risk reward from that point of view has changed. I as a trader, would not be aggressively long stocks here. I also am not looking to be short. You know, there, there could be a wave here where people are still, I would consider, underinvested in the market. So now that they believe that everything's okay, they need to get that money to work, right? Which could continue to push the market up here. Um, but to me, there, there's, for, for what I do, there, there, there's no trade either way. You know, take the profits on the longs if you're a trader. And, and wait for your next low-hanging fruit opportunity, wherever that may present itself. Um, uh, I would say that the major psychological consensus here, something that I hear multiple times every day, is that people think that the market has to have a pullback here. They're bullish, but they think that it has to have a pullback, which indicates to me a few things. One, they're not fully invested. Because if you think that the market has to have a pullback, then you're not fully invested, right? You're waiting and hoping for that pullback to happen so that you can get fully invested. So not knowing what the future brings, um, I see the two highly probable outcomes to that. One is the market just runs away from them, never gives them the pullback to buy and just continues to run away to the upside. Um, that's a possibility. Um the other one is you do get a pullback uh, and it if it lasts for a while and gives everybody a chance to get fully invested, then you're going to have a problem, right? The market just doesn't over time give you a chance, right? It's not going to pull back five to 10% here and sit there for a month and let everybody get invested and then rock, you know, rip up again, right? Once they get all invested, well, then there's no money left to go back in the market. So from there, it's going to be all downside. I don't know, unfortunately, which one of those it's going to be. I watch the market and I watch the reaction to the tape uh, every day to see what's happening with that. Um, but that's where I think we're at. You know what I mean? That's why I say, like, for me, there's there's no edge here in either side. Let's see what happened happen, and then we can trade off of it. But uh, it, it just strikes me nobody wants to chase the market higher because they're scared. So it, it might just run straight away from them for, for all I know. Okay. Well, you tweeted this a uh, couple days ago. If you are a trend follower, momentum trader, and are not getting rich this year, you are doing it wrong. What do you mean by that? I mean, this has been one of the greatest periods ever for trend following. Maybe the greatest period ever for trend following. Yeah. Um, I've seen some of the major trend following programs up 40 50 percent year to date we're talking about in three months right up 40 50 percent in, in three months right so all i'm trying to say is if if what you're doing and i'm not a trend follower but if what you're doing is trend following and you're not making a lot of money this year well then maybe you need to rethink about how you're doing trend following um because this is the time you know all of these strategies have their time right and it's hard because there are times where your strategy doesn't have its time and you have to wait and wait and wait and hopefully not lose what you do, not change what you do because it's not working at this particular time. That happens to a lot of people. Um, but if you have been a trend follower and waiting and, and sticking with your process, you know why now, because now you're crushing it. And, and all I'm trying to say is if that's what you are doing, if you are a trend following trader, and you're not crushing it right now, then you, you, you're you're doing something wrong. You know, you're doing something wrong. Uh, you have told me that one of your strategies is to go against 
the crowd, meaning if there is a particular trade that's really crowded, if that's something that everyone is rushing towards, just take the opposite side of that trade or don't get involved at all. Is there such a trade right now? Do you look at something and say that's really crowded right now? Yes. I mean, first I'll say the, the good thing with that, as this trend following has crushed it, is I have had basically no trades for the last three, four months, right? Which again, you get into discipline and, and you get into process. It's an extremely difficult thing to sit here and do, right? Um, but I know what my process is. I, I'm kind of a counter trend guy, but because there haven't been any crowded trends, I have not been shorting them. And that, in my view, is why the trends have continued because they have not gotten crowded, right? We are now starting to see a few things start to get crowded. Um, things like the long silver trade are starting to get crowded. Things like the short Swiss franc trade are starting to get crowded. Things like short Australian dollar are starting to get crowded. So we're, we're starting to approach a place of, of some crowded things now. Okay. Long Swiss franc, short Swiss franc. Uh, sorry, long silver, short Swiss franc, and then long Australian dollar. Short Australian well, the, the crowded trades are short yeah. Swiss franc long silver and short yeah. Australian dollar. Okay. So um, I would at some point looking to be taking the opposite side of those. Another thing that I think maybe on the service may look crowded, tech stocks. Let's take a look at NVIDIA. So this is an interesting example of something that's gone up in a straight vertical line, even recently. Um, yet the, um, the company is just fundamentally, some would argue, doing really well, beating earnings, creating products that people actually need. Uh, sales numbers are going through the roof. What do you do with a stock like that, Jason? I've made quite a number of videos about NVIDIA for the last seven, eight months. And I don't know what you do, but I know what you don't do. Okay. okay. You, you don't keep shorting it. Okay. Right. And you say crowded, but NVIDIA has not been crowded. Right. Okay. The price has gone up a lot, but I'm sure you can attest that people come on your show, I would bet, and talk about shorting NVIDIA all the time. Because I hear that, that, that's all I've heard for the last year. Everybody wants to short it. Everybody wants, th this is such a problem with people when, when they trade, right? Everybody wants to pick a top, especially if they miss the move up, right? Then they want to try and pick the top. People have been trying to pick the top from the video for the last 500 points. And it's been ridiculous, um, which to me, again, is why it keeps going up because nobody crowds into it on the long side. Um, people get price and participation mixed up just because something's gone up a lot in price doesn't mean that there's massive participation in it okay and nvidia has been nvidia has been the perfect uh the perfect example of that people have, i know many more people who've been trying to short nvidia than i know people that have been getting long nvidia um and not that i know them but i hear and i read and, and, and you know all, all that so um that's really what's gone on with that trade whether you want to be long here you know I don't, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I, I don't know the fundamentals of AI better than anybody else that, that you could read and probably worse than anybody else that you could read. And I personally don't believe that anybody knows what this thing's going to look like in five years from now. Um, it's moving so fast and it's changing everything so fast, so quickly that to predict what it's going to look like in five years seems silly to me. Um, you know, whether other chip companies are going to come in or whether companies are going to start developing their own chips. You, you, you can make these arguments all day. But the bottom line, as we were saying before, is don't trade these things. Trade the market, right? And, and NVIDIA is on an all-time high today, okay? So that's really all you need to know. Like, to short something that is on an all-time high is just, it's just plain silly. Uh, but But if you... Okay, a trader uh, on the other side might argue, well, it's broken above, I don't know, 50-day moving average, 100-day moving average. Well, it's just gone vertical, so it must have broken some bands. Um, probably time to take a correction just from a purely technical standpoint. Again, not even looking at – if you just take the stock ticker out of the equation and just look at a graph of this particular stock, it doesn't matter what it is if you just look at the price pattern. Um, would you not – I'm just arguing to play the devil's advocate here. Would you not want to take some profits – Look, I, I don't own a single share in NVIDIA, so I don't have to worry about taking profits, unfortunately. Okay. But, you know, um, you would have said the same thing, you know, when, 
right? I mean, you, you could have been saying that the whole way up, right? Look at the look at how sure. overbought it was at six hundred. Look at how overbought it was at seven hundred. Look at how overbought it was at eight hundred. Well, now we're at nine fifty. So to to use that as your sole reason to me is is silly. Um, we've had a situation in a market, and like you say, take the ticker out. Okay, forget about it. But I'm just going to tell you, it's cocoa. All right. Coco last August, um, I thought was over was overdone. Okay, to the upside, right? Um, it was trading around thirty five hundred last August. It's now at ninety six hundred. Right. So if you had been shorting it because you thought it was overdone, <laughs> then you have gotten absolutely destroyed. Right. Thirty eight hundred looked overdone. 4,000, it looked overdone, 5,500, 6,500, 8,000. It, it all looked overbought and, and, and over whatever. And meanwhile, we're at new all-time highs today uh, above 9,600. What's the um, ticker? Coco is CC. Okay. So yeah. yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. I mean, I'll put it to you this way. You, you could have waited this entire time and waited for Coco to go from last year at this time, it was around 2,700. You could have waited the entire time from 2,700 and not bought it until yesterday at 9,000. And you made 7% today. I don't know anything else you made 7% today on. So all I'm saying is the idea of, of, of fading something just because it looks overbought can run you over. I'm surprised uh, Hershey stock hasn't crashed in 2024. It's come down a lot in 2023, but Cocoa Futures shot up through the roof in 2024. <laughs> well, it's gone up a lot in 2023 as well. Yeah, so it that's it. That's interesting how how that's gone up, and um, I wonder how that's affecting all the companies using Cocoa. Um, would got to affect them somehow. I mean, I don't know what Hershey's. You know, a lot of people when they see Cocoa, they talk Hershey, right? Um, you don't know what they're hedging strategy is you know what i mean you, you you just you don't know what how much cocoa they have stored if they saw this coming and they bought a bunch of cocoa earlier you know you, you just don't know right somebody knows but i don't know <laughs> yeah not everybody buys by the spot that's true All right, well, I, I do notice that my my hershey bars are suffering from pretty extreme shrinkflation so <laughs> but that's an issue with all groceries you're yes. right um okay well, let's talk about some other specific trades now so uh NVIDIA, we've talked about, you look at all the other MAG7 stocks, they haven't all moved in tandem. Like last, you no, know, 2023 was a great year for all stocks. Tesla's taking a hit now. Um, it's kind of be an outlier now. Are you still, do you still think that people are still as, I guess, bullish or as hot on the tech stocks this year, just from, purely from a sentiment standpoint, as they were in 2023? Are you seeing any evidence of that still, Jason? I don't think that they were bullish with the tech stocks in 2023. I think they were shorting them more than they were buying them. Um, and I don't think that they are necessarily that bullish in tech stocks now either. People have certainly gotten out of bearish phase in the stock market. But what I have noticed is getting out of bearish phase and putting money to work. They don't want to put money to work by chasing the video up, you know, whatever it is, six times or however many times it's gone up, right? They want to put money in the laggards. This is a, an error that, people always make right so they're sitting on a bunch of cash because they were super bearish because the recession was coming they've given up on the recession idea they have to give up on the recession idea their clients are screaming at them that they are underperforming the market they have to get money to work so they're not going to chase the leaders they're going to buy the laggards so they're going to buy the russell the small caps we hear that all day right buy the small caps here buy the small caps here um and as they have started to do that you know the small caps have started to do relatively well but my fear for those people is typically what happens when you do that, when you chase the laggards, is that they were laggards for a reason, right? Um, and what, if and when the market does pull back or go down, those are going to be the ones that get hit the most. That, I, I, that's historically what happens in, in those type of situations. So that's what people are doing. Um, you know, most people, any kind of fund manager, and clearly, there's people who have been invested in NVIDIA, but if you're a fund manager, NVIDIA has become such a large part of your portfolio just because of uh, how much it's gone up 
that you have to cut back just mathematically. You're, you're not allowed to have a certain stock be such a large part of your portfolio, most likely, right? Um, and any sort of investment plan w would have you do that, right? So I feel like people are really cutting back on those names just from math alone and putting that money to work in the lagging sectors, which I believe can work for a while, but will come back to haunt you in the long run. I have to ask you about Bitcoin. Uh, this is an interesting one. It's not a company. It doesn't make chips. doesn't make chocolate. doesn't make candy bars. It's just, you know, it's, it's a cryptocurrency, right? And so it's you can take a look at it from a purely technical standpoint um, versus probably, I guess, some other fundamentals with the supply and demand aspect of Bitcoin. But if you're just take, if you're just to take a look at the chart today, again, breaching seventy thousand dollars a coin once again. Um, shot up in a straight line. Um, I'm not going to ask you what to do with it, but I will ask you, <laughs> what do you not do with Bitcoin? Short it. Short it. <laughs> Same story with NVIDIA as NVIDIA, pretty much. Same story with anything that's on all time highs. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you just don't do it. Um, our stuff that measures crowdedness um, was pretty neutral Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin had its first sort of jump, into the 30,000 area, um, which was back, I think, in October of last year, uh, we noticed that people got very short that, as, as they typically do, because now it hasn't gone anywhere for a long time, so it jumps up, so they sell it. So people got shorted and into that jump. And that, to me, was really the time to buy it when people were shorting that, you know? Well, here, here's the thing, Jason. If you take a look at the price pattern of Bitcoin, every single time, um, going back multiple years, it's reached a new top. It's immediately fallen and corrected by if you know over 30, 40 percent, maybe even 50 percent before maybe eventually climbing back up right away or staying flat for a number of months or years. Right. Take a look at 2021. Reached a new well, high. Take a look at May. take a look at 2017. It made a new high in May of 2017 at 2000. And then the next thing you knew, it was 20,000. So, I mean, you know, you, you, you and then it made a new high at 20,000. It didn't get all the way back up there until about December of 2020, right? And before you knew it, um, it was at 60,000. So yes, then it pulled back. It's easy to look back in retrospect and say it pulled back, you know, and then it kind of double topped up there. And then it had the big pullback in 2022 when everything came down. And now we're back at highs. I don't short new highs in markets. I, I think it's the worst thing you can do. Interesting. Uh, Can you explain that logic for the traders watching? Well, the market is ultimately right, right? So a new high is sending a message, right? Now, clearly, when a market tops, it's going to top from a new high, okay? But over time, trying to short new highs is, is a fool's errand, right? It's bad risk-reward, you know? Short something that starts to underperform first, you know, let it do something first. You know, everybody's so scared that they're going to miss the crash and they have to short every day. But that's not the case. You know, things don't close on new all time highs and the next day they're down 40% and you missed it, right? Let something happen first. Wh whatever it is that you like to look at, 20 day moving average. Okay, let it go through that before you short it. 50 day moving average, 100 day moving, whatever it is you look to like to look at, let it go through that first a and then you can short it if that's what you want to do, if that's what you're looking to do. But let the market confirm it first. You need the market to confirm your view first. You can't just fight the tape. Fighting the tape is the worst thing that you can do over time. And shorting a anything that closes at new all time highs is fighting the tape. Can the opposite also be applied? Should you not buy a new low? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that because that 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 has happened to me uh, in personal experience. Something reaches a low, and I think, okay, it's down fifty percent. How much lower could it get? And you, and you you found out the hard way, didn't you? <laughs> I, I well, what I've learned is that pattern recognition doesn't really apply to stock trading. Just because something has done something in the past doesn't mean it's going to repeat in the future. Just because something's down fifty percent doesn't mean it won't go down another fifty percent. So that's absolutely correct. And you don't need to get the low tick if you're right. You know, here, this thing's down 50%. I want to buy it. Okay, well, wait until it does something that confirms that it's going up first, right? 
You might, right, so let's talk low, about you might not get the low tick, but you'll still make a lot of money if you're right. So let's talk about confirmations. You're looking at a particular stock or asset, whatever the case may be. How do you know that there's there's patterns that confirm momentum upwards or downwards? Can you share some of these with us? So the easy way is just looking at relative returns, right? Um, and I don't know if there's any magic formula, but certainly you want to buy something that starts to at least return well relative to the underlying index, right? Let it do that for not just a day, but maybe a week or a month or something like that, right? Um, you want to be buying strong and selling weak things. Buying things that are trading well and selling things that are trading poorly is, is, is what you want to do. So that's one way to do it. That's not how I do it. I look for market confirmation in the reaction to news events, right? Um, meaning, if there's something I want to buy, let's say Boeing, okay? Since that's sort of a hot topic these days, right? Um, stock's going down, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news, right? So what I'm looking for is more bad news to come out and the stock to not go down on that anymore. Then we know it's sold out. And it doesn't always work, but that's one example of where you can start to buy something, right? When it no longer reacts poorly to the bad news, that's a good time. That's the market confirming to you that, hey, maybe now is a good time to buy it. And same thing on the on the downside, right? If something is going up, 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 and the good news continues to keep coming out, coming out, coming out, and one day this super good news comes out and the market can no longer go up on that, well, maybe that's a good indication that it's done, right? Uh, if they come out tomorrow and say the entire global cocoa crop has been wiped off the face of the earth and there's no cocoa left anywhere on earth and cocoa, close, and cocoa closes down on that news, well, then you can be pretty sure that the thing is, uh, you know, you can't be sure, but it's a good risk reward at that point that maybe you can start selling it there. The adage, buy the rumor, sell the news. How much truth is in that? That's exactly what I'm talking about, you know? So sell the news, right? But don't sell the news. Sell it if the market can't react well to the news. That's what buy the rumor, sell the news is, right? Um, let the good news come out, the best news possible, and let the market not be able to go up on that. That's selling the news. Um, okay. Do you look at options as, uh, as an indicator of interest uh, for a particular stock? in a given day let's say you take a look at open interest or the put call ratio does that give you an indication of uh how the stock is going to trade at least in the short term i personally do not look at a lot of options data no that's not my thing okay um do you know if it works or not for people i think that if i found that it had worked then um i would be using it <laughs> we, okay fair enough I, I, I did have quants um, working for me for a long time and we did look into all this type of stuff and we never found anything there not that there we did, we might have missed stuff but we never found anything there that added value over time to what i do okay um maybe just explain to the people who haven't watched our previous shows by the way i'll put the links to jason and i's interviews in the links in the description down below please check them out uh, and uh, evaluate jason's past calls uh but when you said in the past that when people, everyone believes there's going to be a recession, that's when you go long. Um, just explain that logic one more time for us, and then we'll extrapolate the same logic for today's environment. Meaning if everyone's bearish, okay, somebody who doesn't understand your rationale or your style might say, well, Jason, if everyone's bearish in the economy, doesn't that mean we should short? Isn't that just a logical thing to do? Well, there's a lot of wisdom in all those statements. Isn't that, that the logical thing to do? Maybe, but the market's not logical. So if you're going to try to treat it like it's logical, you're going to have a hard time making money because the market is not logical. Uh, if it were logical, it would be simple and everybody would be getting rich. Okay. Um, so, right. That's the logical thing to do. How'd that work for you last January when everybody came out at the beginning of 2023 and every single person was completely convinced that recession was coming and they had a million reasons why and it all sounded very logical it all made a lot of sense right what they were saying how'd that do for you getting short at the beginning of 2023 you know that that's all you need to know like we're, we are trying to make money in the markets we are not trying to be logical
Well, what happened was it was it really okay? So maybe one of two things happened. People weren't really all that bearish. In other words, maybe it was just a few select people being bearish and being loud on the internet, but Main Street, Wall Street was actually just very bullish. That's possibility number one. Possibility number two was that there were a lot of short positions and they all got margin called, and you needed to just you know that that pushed the market up. What what? I would, vote, speaking, I would vote more to the second. I don't think that there were only a small amount of people that were bearish. Everybody, everybody was bearish. You can attest to it. Go back and, and, and look at your, your interviews at the beginning of last year. 99% of the people must have been bearish. Okay. Um, everybody was bearish. And, and that's really how the market works. Unfortunately, it's the exact opposite of logic, right? I didn't know at the time when I was telling you, hey, you got to be long here, right? I didn't know that the recession was not going to come, okay? I didn't know that. I have no way of forecasting whether a recession is coming or not. But it's just a risk-return calculation. If everybody thinks it's coming and it comes, well, then there's not a lot of money to be made because they're already positioned for that. Whereas if it doesn't come, then there is a lot of money to be made because everyone has to reposition, which is exactly what they did, right, between then and now, right? And that's really all it is in trading and even investing. It's just a risk reward thing, right? So that's why being contrarian to what everybody's saying over time works. It doesn't work every single time, but your downside is so small and your upside relative to your downside is so big. And that's the situations you want to get in over time. Personally, I believe I was talking about this to you. Um, what I said was what could happen was... If everybody is positioning for recession, and forget about investors for a second, think about business owners, right? If business owners are positioning for a recession, what are you going to do as a business owner? You're going to cut back, right? You're not going to want to spend extra money if you think a recession's coming. You're going to want to hoard. So they all hoarded. And then, therefore, the recession didn't come. And now they got to catch up. So now they got to start reinvesting again. So things accelerate. That to me is what happened, um, both from an investor point of view and from an actual business owner point of view. Do you think this reacceleration of deployment uh, of capital is going to reignite inflation? I would certainly think so. You know, I have been the, of the opinion, and I am no macroeconomist. Okay, let's start with that. I what I tend to do with my macroeconomic ideas is I let the market tell me what it's doing, and then I try to find the macroeconomic story that makes sense for that to happen, right? Explain that to happen, right? Um, I, I do it backwards. I don't say, hey, here's what the macroeconomics are going to do. Therefore, this is what the market should do. I say, this is what the market's doing. And therefore, this is probably what's going on with the macroeconomics, right? So to me, what this has been saying is that interest rates are too low, right? Um, if interest rates... If interest rates were too low, let's just say, we, we don't know if they are, we don't even know how to measure if they are, okay? But let's just say in some world, interest rates were too low, then what would happen, right? And to me, what would happen is assets would rocket higher if interest rates were too low, right? Because tons of money would be out there looking to go to work, they can get these cheap interest rates and they can put money to work. Well, that's exactly what's happened, be it stock markets around the world it's not just nvidia right dow s p nasdaq the dax the euro stocks the nikkei i mean these indexes don't have nvidia in them right all at all time highs all time highs okay bitcoin all time highs gold basically all time highs right assets around the world all time highs you can't tell me that financial conditions are too tight when all of these assets are going to all time highs. You can't tell me that, it doesn't make sense, right? To me, they're too loose, right? And there may be a number of reasons for that that I don't know. Maybe the Fed is seeing something that I don't know. You know, Maybe they're seeing into the future somewhat and they know that things are going to get you know worse going forward. Therefore, they don't want to tighten financial conditions. Maybe it has to do with the whole election conspiracy thing, right? They don't want to raise rates because they don't want to kill the economy before the election, because whatever, they don't like Donald Trump or whatever it is, right? They don't want to do that. Maybe it's that, right? Um, I don't know. But all I know is what's in front of me, which is that assets are, are, are at new all-time highs across the globe. You know, not just some assets, tons of assets 
you know? So there's clearly no lack of liquidity. And that can go away very quickly. Listen, we have numbers that come out next week and suddenly GDP goes down, suddenly employment goes down, suddenly CPI goes down or whatever. That can clearly happen. But as of today, the 25th of March, that has not happened. And if you tell me that's happened, you're insane, okay? If you had gone to sleep five years ago and woke up today and looked at the last six months of economic numbers, growth numbers, inflation numbers, employment numbers, which are the three biggies, right? You would not be saying, when is the Fed cutting rates? You would be saying, when is the Fed raising rates and by how much? That's all you'd be saying. So uh, that, that actually was my next point. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll close it off here. Uh, last year, everyone was obsessed with the idea of a recession. Now the uh, point of a, or the topic of obsession or the uh, topic du jour for this year is a Fed pivot. Like you just said, people are concerned about when the Fed will cut and what will the markets do in response. One narrative, and I'll present to you this narrative for you to react to, is that the markets are pricing in too many cuts for the reasons you've outlined earlier. Inflation may not come down right away, which may mean that the Fed will stay tighter and keep rates higher for longer, which means the markets will be disappointed by their faulty expectations for more cuts than actual than reality, which means we're going to get a big crash later this year. That's the narrative. OK, but you know what? They came into the year expecting six cuts. We're three months into the year and now they only expect two or three. Market hasn't crashed. Market's gone straight up. OK, so even that narrative hasn't worked, you know. What's going to happen in the future is a different story, but the market will tell you, you know what I mean? Let If you're looking to short the market, then let it tell you first. L let it go down on that type of news first. All it does is go up on that type of news right now. So what are you doing shorting it, right? If that's what you believe, the market's going to crash because they're not going to be able to cut rates as much as you think. Then let them come out and say they're not going to be able to cut rates as much as you think and let the market go down on that. And then you can short it, okay? But... Don't fight the tape in the meantime. You're not going to miss the crash, okay, if that's what you're looking to catch. You're not going to wake up tomorrow when the market closes on an all-time high and, and the market's going to be down 30% in the morning. It, it just It's never happened that way. I, I tell people all the time, the 08 crash, the market topped in 07, middle of, in the summer of 07. It didn't crash till 08. Even 87, it crashed in October. The market topped in July or August, okay? You had two months okay to catch, to catch the crash so you know, people lose more money a trying to short and b trying to pick tops than anything else so you have to let the market tell you don't tell the market let it tell you i don't care what your narrative is you know but let the market tell you you're right before you do anything <laughs> can, can the market never can the market ever be wrong can a group of people smart people moving money around ever just be like you know what i make a big mistake surely they've made a mistake in 2007 when things kept going up and no one really saw the big lehman crash I, i'm just throwing out random ideas out there but i think you get my point how can the market be wrong i, I just don't even understand the concept you're trading the market if you're short and the market goes up you're wrong if you're long and the market goes down, you're wrong. The market's not but, wrong. The market's but, right. But I, I hear this all the time from people. The market's wrong. Like the market doesn't And how is their P&L doing? <laughs> the you hear that from people all the time that, that are losing money. The only people that say that are people that are losing money. You never say the market's wrong when you're making money, okay? You only say the market's wrong when you're losing money. I get it. Okay. So, I, I mean, I'm going to tell that to my banker next week. He's going to be like, hey, man, you got no money in your bank account. I'm like, yeah, but that's because the market's wrong. He doesn't care, okay? So the whole the market's wrong thing to me is is it, it's it's just silly. Can you end on this? Can you give us a few trades that you like right now that you're long in? Maybe something some things you've already shared with your uh, with your community. I, I just got long a Swiss franc on the reversal day on Friday. Really, the only trade I have on. Um, and I can tell you, you talk about the market being right or wrong. If it takes out the Friday low. OK, then I am wrong. OK, I'm picking a turn. If it takes out the new low, I did not successfully pick a turn by definition. So I am out. So I'm long the Swiss franc. I'm long it against the Friday low. If the Friday low gets taken out, 
I will be stopped out. I have losing trades all the time. Unlike a lot of the pundits out there, I actually do have losing trades. I know these guys, you know, they only have winning trades, okay? I actually have a lot of losing trades, all right? And I don't care because I take my loss and I move on, right? And then the winners more than make up for the losers. And that's what trading and that's what making money over time is all about. But that's a trade I have on. I got long the Swiss franc on the Friday close on the reversal day uh, where all the other currencies were down and the Swiss was the only one that was up. And I got long. And if it takes out that Friday low, I'm out. And I'll be looking to long again on some kind of news failure. Um, that's how I trade. The, the, that's, the, that, that's the trade to me. All right, so reverse on the Swiss franc. Uh, final question, the U.S. dollar then, since we're talking about the currency, are you are you taking the reverse side of the U.S. dollar as well? If you're if you're going to be long the franc, are you shorting the dollar? Just long in the Swiss franc. That's it. That's it. That's the only place where my data says to do. That's the only place where the market has confirmed that idea. So that's the only place that I'm doing it. Okay. And but do do you, do you have any thoughts on the U.S. dollar, people? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing all sorts of opinions. I'm curious to get yours. You know, I, I think it all depends, unfortunately, on the unknowable, which is what the hell is going on with the Fed and what the hell are they doing? Are they, in fact, completely out of their minds for even talking about cutting rates here? Or are they, in fact, doing something because we don't know what's coming and maybe they do, right? Or there's a third option. Are they, in fact, manipulating this because they know damn well that if interest, if interest rate expectations start getting out of control, the U.S. government has to fund a huge amount of debt. The banks have to fund a huge amount of you know commercial real estate thing that's going on. And if that came to pass, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Maybe they know that, so they're trying to keep talking down rates. If that is what the case is, then I think that's the most dangerous thing there is because the market will ultimately go where the market's going to go. The Fed can talk and talk, and they can affect short-term moves in the market, but ultimately – it's going to go where it has to go. And if the case is that interest rates should actually be a lot higher, but the Fed is trying to jab them down because of these problems that could occur, then I think we're in a lot of trouble. And, and that, would, that would be bad dollar. That would be bad everything. So, Tell us about the credit market report. What can we learn from that report or your service, your website? Where can we go to learn more? Yeah, we started the credit market report a few years ago um, after I was in the Market Wizards book. A lot of people coming to me asking me if I could help them. They related to my chapter in the book. And um, so because there were so many people doing that, one of them suggested we start a website. So he did. So we could centralize it. So people join there. We've made it very affordable. Um, you get a newsletter every weekend, which is my, has always been what I've been writing for 20 years for myself on the weekend about my trades and what I was looking to trade has turned into this newsletter. You get a Discord where we're on there all the time. We do Friday afternoon conversations. We do Sunday evening conversations. Um, and that's what CrowdedMarketReport.com is. And I tell people, if you would like to join, we'd love to have you. In particular, if you can add to our Discord. We have, it's not just me. We have a lot of people on there now, and, and they're all adding different things, and, and it's been great. But don't come there with the expectation that Jason Shapiro is going to – this is not a tip sheet, Okay. I do put my trades on there, but it's more from the point of view of watch me trade so you can see how I handle my discipline and, and, and how I handle my process and all that, because that's what's important in trading. This is not, we're going to help you turn $10,000 into a million dollars in six months, okay? If that's what you're looking for, there's plenty of people out there that claim they can do that for you. This is about learning how to actually handle trading. We'll focus a lot about the, the themes of risk management. We focus a lot about the themes of process. We focus a lot on discipline. We talk about individual trades and what people think, but you know, you can't trade like me. I can't trade like you, but these other disciplines cut across no matter how anybody trades, right? And that's really what we try to focus. We're, we're trying to, I like to say, we're not trying to give people fish. We're, we're trying to teach people to fish. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much for your time today and your insight. You, Follow Crowded Market Report in the link down below and uh, watch some of my interviews with Jason uh, in the past couple of months last year. And uh, yeah, Jason's been pretty much spot on both interviews. We'll see what happens this time. Um, <laughs> you've had a pretty good track record on my show. Thank you again, Jason. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.